You're listening to Got Tech, the podcast with your hosts, Eric Geis and Nick Johnson. Welcome back to Got Tech, the podcast. This is episode 108 called 15 Awesome Cell Phone Apps for Teachers and Students. In this episode, we'll review 15 smartphone apps that deserve a place in your classroom. We'll also discuss some of the pros and cons of allowing cell phone use in schools. This is another episode you don't want to miss. Check it out. So we're back for another one. We have spring break. We can see the light at the end of the tunnel heading into the spring break. Nick, do you have any big plans over spring break? No, I have no big plans, which is which is for me the big plan because I can't wait to have no big plans and just hang out. There's one. What's the one thing we're doing? I think we're meeting up with some friends in Washington, D.C. because around this time of year, I believe they have... Um, What's the tree that flowers? It's like a big deal. People go see the, the flowering trees in the spring. Cherry blossom. That's the Apple. one. Yeah, it's oh. cherries. So we're gonna have we're gonna go see the cherry blossoms in bloom and bring and bring the kids along too. So that sounds like a good time. I guess. Yeah, we'll see. I'll let you know if the cherry blossoms are worth it. What What about you? You got anything going on? So you know, we moved. So I will be spending most of break getting the outside ready for spring mulching. All that good stuff. We have a lot more flower beds at the new house. I, I definitely realized that. And because uh, I was kind of calculating how much mulch we needed. And at the old house, we needed seven, what is it, cubic yards? I think yeah. that's what they measure it in. Yep. Oh, we need 15 with the oh. new house. So uh, <laughs> I will probably be walking in with a cane after spring break. So, <laughs> but I will tell you this I really enjoy yard work when I have the time to do it. And spring break is always a great time to get that stuff ready. And so that's what I will be doing. I'm going to kind of shut down from technology, I think, for at least a couple of the days during spring break, uh, which is awesome, too, because it gets me refreshed for the rest of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Get outside, everybody. Take a break from, uh, oddly enough, from your your cell phones as well, because that's what we're talking about in this episode. So kind of weird to say that, but it's important to do. I get we have to touch on, too, at the beginning here, the uh the finale, the wrap up officially of the March EdTech Madness Bracket, officially put together by Kyle Nemus, but we helped him out because the last time we recorded, it was, I don't think it was quite over. And you, my friend, uh, seemed pretty certain it was going to be quiz is as the winner. And it was not right. Somehow Nearpod pulled it out. Do I have that correct? Yeah. So uh, I, I don't know if, if Kyle changed the time or what, what happened, but uh, <laughs> quizzes was up by 4% when we recorded with a couple hours left in Nearpod, uh, kudos to them and their followers uh, came back and, and pulled it off. So they upset the, the past champion. They are now the current champion. Congratulations to Nearpod. But it was just overall great experience. I think uh, Kyle did an amazing job on it. He got over 25,000 people to vote, which is absolutely phenomenal. I think it's probably the biggest ed tech bracket that I saw this year. So that that's just amazing. And I think with that, let's just uh, kick it into segment two right now, which is all about these mobile apps for teachers and students. Now, Nick, you did a great job putting together 15 of these, some of them which I use and some of them which uh, I plan on at least checking out. So before we get into those 15, we constantly have this uh, debate with teachers whether or not student devices, their own personal devices, cell phones, things like that, should be able to be used in the classroom. Some students bring their iPads. Uh, some have cell phones. Most of them have cell phones. So really, let's just hash it out a little bit. What are some of the pros and cons? Let's start with the pros of bringing personal devices. Most kids at our school have their Chromebook, but it's not really the all be all. So I, I do feel like phones and personal devices kind of fill the gaps. So I, I'm going to call that out as a first pro. Yeah, for sure, man. And I, it's just, it's a weird thing. Like I, I'm pretty sure 
students are still not allowed to have cell phones in class. But at, at least at our school, it definitely is not enforced like it used to be. I don't know if that's a COVID thing. And we're all just trying to figure out how to be back in school normally again. So that's taking a back seat. But, you know, it used to be pretty heavily talked about and, and teachers would worry about like, got to stop the cell phone use. Got to When you walk into the room, you got to put your cell phone in the little like a little uh, teachers used to buy the like your closet shoe holders and the kids would have to put their cell phones in those. I just don't see as much of it happening anymore. Um, I think a lot of that maybe is people sort of just recognizing that, you know, these these cell phones that the students have, at, at least at the high school level, I'm guessing middle school, not as much with the elementaries, but I have heard it's kind of creeping in there too. It's just a fact of life. And that actually is one of the the pros to allowing phones in schools that I, th I thought is that you can't ignore these things. They're, you know, people, the students that we have now are going to be adults and they're going to be using phones. And maybe we should factor that in. Maybe instead of trying to fight this almost unwinnable fight of stop using your cell phone, maybe we use it as a, as a teaching tool. Maybe it's time to show the kids how to use it responsibly, appropriately, even tie in, you know, it's a good place for some digital literacy too. Yeah, for me, I, I always thought the phones had a lot to do with testing, being able to share answers, uh, those types of things. But really, if you're giving a, a really well-written test, I feel like they can't look up the answer. It's more of an application type question on those tests. So I just don't see any reason why that can't happen. Yeah, same. I mean, COVID taught me that. I was given tests remotely and I had no control over the cell phones, whether they used them or not. And they, they very well may have been texting each other. In fact, I'm sure that they were. I had no evidence of it, but it ended up like not mattering at all. The, the, the students' test scores remained essentially the same. You know, their performance at the end of the year on a final exam, essentially the same, maybe even better, actually. They did a little bit better last year. So I don't know. It just doesn't even seem to really even matter that much for these things that we thought it might. So that's a, that's a pro for sure if you spin it a certain way. The obvious things, like you can send students reminders. There's a, the, the most popular app, I think, it used to be called Remind 101, and they just simplified to Remind. You can just send kids via text little reminders about homework and, and stuff like that. And, and you could even tie that in with maybe teach the kids that you can actually use your phone to keep track of stuff. Like tell them, here's a really cool app, uh, one we're going to talk about a little bit later called Trello. What a great way to organize yourself. I mean, we used to give out these agenda books where students would write down homework. Those don't exist anymore. At least I don't think they do. So, you know, they've got their phones. Why not start teaching them now how to use that? Here's how you download Google Calendar and look through the different things that are happening in school. Here's how you can add your own stuff. A lot of the kids, when I'm giving, uh, you know, talking in class, they take their phone out to take a picture of what's written on the board so they can reference it later. They're using the, the the notes app that comes with the phone and they're, they're just so ingrained in it that maybe, you know, we can use it for some of the positives that are naturally built in. Yeah. What about QR codes? I mean, yeah, you can scan those with a Chromebook, but I always think that students look kind of silly holding up their Chromebook like this, trying to scan something. Yeah. Why not allow them to use their phone if it gets them what they need to get? So. Yeah, with the, the whole teaching digital literacy and just being more productive. I mean, if it's quicker to do it that way, it allows students to use it. And I've always been one to allow kids to use cell phones in my classroom. Uh, sometimes they would be a distraction. I had this mother that kept calling her son during my class. Why? I'm not, I'm not sure. She could easily text him. But uh, every time she called, I would basically just stick out my hand kid would place the phone in my hand and then I would talk to mom for a couple of you know <laughs> seconds I'd be like hey what's going on Mrs. Smith I, I can't I'm not going to release the name here but I'd just be like hey what's going on Mrs. Smith and uh she'd be like uh you're not my son I go no but this is his chemistry class or the biochem class or this is his biology class uh everyone say hello and you know they would say hello and you know, eventually, it's not just teaching the students, but it's also sometimes teaching the parents when it's appropriate to make a phone call or, or things like that. And, you know, the kid was all right with it. So there are ways to, you, you talked a little bit about the, the shoe rack where, you know, that would hang over a door in a closet where you could put pairs of shoes, a little plastic thing. That's a great way to manage cell phones. So if you're really worried about it, you could have them do that. I know some math teachers 
do the same thing with calculators when they don't want them to use calculators. So all these are, are great things. It's just a, I feel like it's just another tool in a teacher's toolkit that's going to help engage students and make them successful. And I think that's what this episode's all about. So unless you have anything else, I think we should get into the main bulk of the 15 mobile apps. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and a podcast to get you there. Explore more podcasts at www.teachbetterpodcastnetwork.com. Now let's get back to the episode. Yeah, sure. Let's do it. I'll, I'll kick it off. So we've, we group these things as we sometimes do. The first category, uh, we have a couple apps that fall roughly within the, I guess what you could call curation, where you're just collecting things and, and saving things. And, you know, we always talk about ways to do this in a Chrome browser, but there's lots of ways you can do it from a cell phone too. And that's, that's how I do most of my, my reading, actually, from looking at articles and stuff. It's probably on my cell phone. So uh, there's a really cool app called Pocket and Pocket allows you to pretty much do that. Save things that you're reading from any source, puts it all in one space within the app so you can reference it later. So this includes news articles, magazine articles, uh, even videos. If you're watching a video, you can save it. Uh, I do the cooking in my house, so I'm making dinner every night. You can save your recipes there too, so it's a little bit easier to find them and you're not trying to scroll back and, and search to find the exact same recipe you were looking up on, you know, Sunday, the week before. Web pages, really, I mean, the list goes on. Anything you can find on your phone, really, you can save it in pocket. Um, one of the things that's nice about it is they have a very clean layout, so it kind of makes it a little bit easier to, to look through, and you get to get rid of a lot of the clutter that a typical website might have. Um, so I like that part about it. If you are looking at your phone before bed, which is a bad habit, but I know a lot of people do that, uh, they do have themes you can switch to, like a dark theme or like a, a theme that kind of gets rid of that blue light that kind of keeps you awake and is really bad for your eyes. So that helps too. Maybe my favorite thing is that they have a listen feature. So if I, there's an article that you started reading, but you had to stop and finish it, you save it with Pocket. You can go back and have Pocket play that. Uh, out loud to you later, almost like a, you know, like you're listening to a podcast, but it's just reading this article. It's not going to sound, you know, great, like there's somebody speaking, but it's going to read it and you can listen to it maybe in the car on the on your ride home to get finished up. So this is a really cool thing, I think, for teachers to be aware of, maybe a good time saver. You can put this in the productivity category too. But uh, yeah, man, that's our first one. Pocket, check it out. That one sounds amazing. I, I like the fact that you're able to just kind of organize things in there and, and revisit them. A lot of times when I use my cell phone to do work, especially if I have my laptop close by, I'll have my laptop open. But if I have to, if I don't have the two screen functionality, I'll use my phone as my second screen. And I'll put pull up the document that I have to look at in order to work on my, my laptop. So this is definitely one of those that if I save something important that I wanted to revisit, I would save it in pocket, look at that on my phone, and then translate it into something on my computer. The next one is another one that we talk about all the time for its uh, capability of managing projects, team projects, and tasks, and things like that. And that's called Trello. Trello has a phone app as well. Uh, so if you picture a website, it kind of looks like your email, but uh, instead of the email horizontally, it's going to have categories vertically. So you can create these categories or these cards and you could put them under a category. So for example, if Nick and I would ever decide to write a book and we wanted to organize everything by chapter, we could do that in Trello. We could have chapter one. Here's what we're going to write about. These are the infographics. These are the stories that we're going to tell, and it will be underneath. And we could assign them a date and a time to complete. And then we go to, you know, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, and so on and so forth. So Trello is a great way to organize these big projects. I'm also thinking in school, sometimes we have fundraisers, and there's many different components to fundraisers. So for Trello, what you could do is invite your whole team to this Trello board, you have your different committees. That would be the category, would be the different committees. And then what they could do is assign tasks. And when they're going to complete them, they can change the color of the little card uh, to match um, 
the progress. So if red means they're not working on it, yellow means it's currently in progress, green means it's completed, it gets everyone on the same page, and it's just uh, pretty amazing. Great thing about this is you could work on these cards from anywhere. So if there's a project due after spring break and different people are going to be free at different times, they can work on it, communicate without having to actually communicate with the other people in the group. So Trello is an awesome one. Check it out. Yeah, it's really great. And there's a web-based version too. So if I'm, uh, if I have the app up and I'm looking at the same board as Geis is, he's on his computer looking at that same board, you can collaborate in real time. So changes that I'm making on my phone in the app are automatically appearing on the computer screen too. And it's pretty seamless. We love this tool. And let's get into the next set, which uh, officially we, we call productivity apps. The first one is called Class Tree. Uh, Class Tree is really simple in what it does. So we don't need to talk about it a whole lot. Um, but it's a, another solution that's out there for really collecting forms. A lot of the housekeeping work that we deal with as teachers for permission slips, let's say, if you're running a field trip. Consent forms, if you're posting some class videos online, you wanna make sure that everybody's uh, students and parents uh, allow this and they are approved to have their image out there. On the internet, you wanna get that consent form signed. Uh, we had to do this for our podcasting course and the students had to sign consent forms. You can orchestrate that with this app called Class Tree. So it's very secure, just another communication channel for things like e-signatures and, and, and that type of reporting. There's other stuff like sharing and event reminders, but to me, the real benefit of, of this is the, uh, you know, the, the e-signature feature because I know that would be a, a giant time saver if I could do all of this electronically via an app. So that's a cool one. Check out Class Tree. That sounds like something you're interested in. Yeah, let's get into my next one, which I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation of it, but <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll give it a shot and you can tell me what you think. Adidio. Adidio? I don't know. Adidio. Yeah, I think I was going to go Adidio, but I, I, I see both. Let's just keep switching back and forth so we're right no matter what. All right, so it's A-D-D-I-T-I-O. And basically, this is your one-stop shop for classroom management when it comes to taking attendance, calculating grades, taking notes on students' performance, and even uh, scheduling your lectures and assignments. Uh, you could do all this within Adicio. So uh, the one thing I want to highlight here is uh, the ability to take notes about student performance. So for this one, if you're a coach, uh, this is one that you can easily take down notes about how they're they're working in practice. If you're doing tryouts, uh, things like that, you could take these notes and then later on put them somewhere else if you would like to. Uh, if you're having a discussion in class, you could take notes. You don't have to use a small piece of scrap paper you can take the notes. Once it's digital, it's easy to share out. So Adicio is one of those ones that uh, I would also use as a wellness teacher, a gym teacher. You're outside and maybe you're not close to your LMS or maybe the LMS doesn't have a phone app. You could put it into Adicio and then take attendance out there. And when you get inside, you can translate that over to your however you take attendance. So these are just a couple of the things that you could do in Adicio. And uh, I think you should check that one out as well. Yeah, that one's kind of weird because if you do have, and, and most schools do now, you're going to have some sort of learning management system that in all likelihood already has an app that's going to do a lot of this. But may, maybe that's not your situation. and may, Or maybe a, a Didio, if that's how you say it, can support the LMS you are using. So um, I like some of your ideas there for, you know, using it if you go outside or different things like that. Our next category is gamification tools. Uh, we've got two of these as well. The first one is is quite well known. It's called Quizlet. I brought this up to make sure that we're tying in some stuff for the students as well, because a lot of these are for like teacher productivity and sort of, you know, doing our jobs better. But really, a lot of it should be about the students and how can, you know, having a cell phone support their learning and, and Quizlet. I just see so many students using this. Uh, it's it's basically digital flashcards, if you don't know. Uh, but in the Quizlet app, they can do that. They can use these flashcards, which on a phone, kind of cool, because they feel a whole lot more like real flashcards. They can kind of swipe through them, which is 
you get a better feel for it. There's also a, a lot more stuff that you can do. And, and I didn't know about a lot of these, so I figured I would share them out. So you've got your typical flashcards that you can create or just use sets that have been pre-made. The I know the AP students will go to Quizlet because a lot of the pre-made flashcards are using, you know, AP questions that somebody else made and put in there and they can all be shared because the AP questions are very standardized across the, the world, really. So they're all there, ready to go. You can make your own too, though. Um, some real other really cool stuff they have is ver expert verified textbook solutions. So if there's like a really common history textbook, you may find that questions from that textbook have solutions on Quizlet that have been verified by teachers or experts in that field. So when the students are looking at those solutions, they know they're getting good information. Um, I've already mentioned a little bit that flashcards can be shared with friends and, and classmates between, uh, you know, between the app. Uh, just tons of really cool stuff. They, they also do some translational things. So we were just dealing with a, uh, or helping a student get started here who was a, a refugee from Afghanistan and trying to figure out how to convert you know, this student's digital tools into the language that, that he speaks. Um, Quizlet does a lot of that for you. Right now they have 18 different languages that they'll automatically convert uh, their, their flashcards into. And this is, you know, one of the other really popular spots is world languages where Quizlet's being used because there's a lot of memorization there. They've got tons of that stuff already built in. Um, you know, I could go on here, but I think you guys get the idea. The Quizlet app is a really great way to use Quizlet, suggest it to your students, maybe even show them how it works and, uh, and get started with that. One. Yeah, it's funny because I didn't know Quizlet had a mobile phone app, but uh, until the other day when a student told me, yeah, I feel like uh, I'm online dating flashcards <laughs> right now with all the swiping and stuff. Yeah. All right. So my next one is uh Classcraft. So this is one that we talk about gamification. It's most known for its desktop gamification capabilities. This is uh, an, a mobile app. If you use the Classcraft uh, PC, laptop, Chromebook, that type of thing, uh, application, it's the companion app. And it allows you to manage what you already set up, whether you're a teacher, student, or parent. So you can manage Classcraft on the go. And uh, basically, you will need to set up a class on a desktop computer or laptop and create the account there. But then you could start playing and you could start accessing and manipulating that game scene there. So if you don't know what Classcraft is, basically, students have the ability to make their own avatar. And as they perform tasks, Basically, what we want to do here is have them demonstrate good behaviors, completing homeworks, completing projects, doing well on tests, quizzes, assessments, those types of things. And then they get points, and these points can be used to, you know, modify their avatar. It unlocks certain things that they're able to um, make their avatar look a little bit different. Students love it. It's a great way to maybe reach out to some of your toughest students' behavioral with uh, some behavioral issues, it's a great way to reach them uh, and kind of build a team and a safe space around them. So check out Classcraft. Yep, Classcraft, a great tool. We have talked about it before, but it's it's been quite a while. So if you want to head back to some of our older episodes, you'll see that featured a little more prominently. But the app is definitely a great companion to the, the web tool. Uh, as is our, as is the next app too. They have a you know a desktop version or a web based version you can use from your computer, uh, but also the app is great to have for the handheld version. It's called Class One Two Three. Uh, this is in our classroom management category. And Class One Two Three, I mean it's that's what it does. It's classroom management. So anything you can think of like giving instant feedback to your students where they're submitting work, you can do that via the app. Um, you know, in setting goals for students that are like kind of posted there within the class one, two, three space, keeping parents informed. You can send out private letters uh, automatically to an entire class's worth of parents or just an individual student. You know, that includes sharing things that are going on in class. This part I really liked. So if you've got a really fun activity or project or event taking, 
taking pictures, sharing them via the app home so people can see what's going on. Sounds really cool. Uh, one of my favorite parts about it too is the way that you can interact with students there. So when your students log in as a class, they can set an avatar and you give feedback uh, as you know via these avatars and you can make them animated and it's goofy and it's silly. I get the sense that this might be better for the lower grades. Uh, they even have something called the the wow camera, which I have not used, but it looks like it's kind of like the filters you get in Instagram and, and TikTok and all the other apps where it filters out different colors or puts a little picture on around your face or whatever it's going to be, as well as tons of other classroom tools like timers, stopwatches, alarms, digital whiteboards you can share what's on your phone screen up to like a projector and then use the whiteboard so you can write if you're somewhere else and maybe it's being projected that the kids can see. So uh, you get the idea, just tons of really cool stuff. And if you're looking for a tool like this, maybe class one, two, three, and uh, their app is the way to go. Yeah, that's uh, another fantastic find that I could see using it in multiple different cases. I mean, I could come up with a couple. Uh, the next one is called Apple Classroom. Don't get this confused with Google Classroom. It's totally different. Uh, this one, if we were in Apple school, I would definitely make sure that this is an app that's uh, included in my daily routine. So I guess the best way to think of Apple Classroom is kind of like class view. So every student would have a device, an iPad or a Mac, and it allows you to do a couple different things. Once you have it configured, it will link all the nearby iPads or Macs together into one class, and you will be able to do a couple of things. Uh, first, it allows you to connect to all those iPads. It, you can push out a website and it will push it out to all of the devices in there. Uh, you could log students out of a shared iPad. So if you have one class of kids and then the next class use the same shared iPads, you have the ability to manage those individually and log them out, which is uh, pretty, pretty key when trying to do stuff quickly and change from one class to the next. You could also view each one of their devices. So this is called screen view and you can see an overview of all the students at once or you could focus on a single student. So it's kind of like a big brother thing where you can make sure that instead of watching March Madness or on uh, CNN or whatever news choice that they would choose, they're actually on task and on point. So students will know when their screens are being viewed. So that's a little less creepy, I guess. Uh, but you could easily share documents and links and all that good stuff using AirDrop. Uh, you could share it to the entire class just using one tap. So Apple Classroom, not like Google Classroom, but I think it's a pretty awesome mobile app. Yeah, there's a lot of classrooms and schools out there that, you know, might may be running Apple devices as their primary. We're we're Google based here, so that's what we talk a lot about, but it sounds like a pretty cool tool if you are not. So, check it out. Uh, these next couple features are for students specifically. Uh, the first one is a fairly simple app called YouTube Kids, and that's exactly what it is. It's a video app that streams out all the garbage that you're going to find on YouTube for adults that may not be appropriate and only puts there the, the stuff that's safe for kids to watch, the hopefully educational things. So if you've got a way for students to access apps in your classroom, this might be something that you request to be on there. Maybe you've got your own kids at home and you know they, you know, obviously they're gonna wanna watch videos on their mobile device and YouTube Kids is a way to give them that, that YouTube access. Uh, but in a slightly safer way. So um, it's it's a great tool to know about and be aware of as parents, as teachers, and I think it could be an important part of uh, lots of different classrooms. You can also go to youtube.com slash kids if you want to check out the web version of this before checking out the app, but it looks like a cool one. I'm going to have to get this one for my, my kids. My kids, uh, they're early risers. They're usually up anywhere between 4.30 and 5.30 in the morning. Uh, two of them, and then the other one wakes up around seven. Uh, the two early risers, uh, we just started to allow them to go downstairs and, and play in the living room. Uh, we laid down some ground rules, but they're pushing the boundaries like kids do. 
and they are trying to, well, my oldest one just ordered a the uh, NBA package the rest of the season, which was 15 bucks, and he didn't understand what he did wrong. So uh, that's another one of my spring break things. I'm going to have to set passcodes and permissions and all that good stuff uh, in order for him to, I don't know, just not run up my credit card bill. Uh, so YouTube for kids, it's only going to pull the the videos that are appropriate for his age group. So that's pretty cool. I'm going to download that on my smart TV, uh, as well as any type of mobile devices like the iPad that he sometimes uses. But we try to limit the amount of screen time as much as we can. Uh, the next one up is Freckle. And Freckle allows students to work automatically on their math uh, and their ELA and science and social studies skills. Uh, there are over 49,000 math questions, 16,000 ELA questions, 8,000 nonfiction articles, and they are written at three different levels uh, covering all K through 12. So the first thing it's going to do is it's going to provide the student a pretest, and it's going to kind of gauge what their reading level is. And then through collaborative uh, features that encourage students to help each other, motivate each other, um, some real world questions. This is all going to allow students to practice their math knowledge in a real world setting and using the skill level or the reading level or the comprehension level that best works for them. So that's going to help challenge them, but still make them successful. So that is called Freckle. Yeah, it seems like the the real world questions there are an important part of what Freckle is doing. And, you know, for me as a teacher, I know that's always the toughest thing to it's just hard to write good questions. So Freckle is going to have a lot of that built in and do a lot of it automatically for you, too. So it's a great tool. I think let's see. These next two tools are in our AR VR category. So augmented and virtual reality. Let's just cover both of these at once because it's all sort of within the same realm. This first one is very cool. It's called Virtuality, and T is spelled T-E-E -E for T-shirt. Uh, so right off the top, you got to know that this is to be used in coordination with a physical product that you must buy. So just know that from the beginning. Uh, that product is a T-shirt, and that T-shirt has some, I'm assuming, some kind of marking on it that when you have the app and you hold up the app, uh, hold up your phone with the app open, it detects the it detects the virtuality t-shirt and it projects something onto it for that augmented reality experience. So, you know, a lot of the stuff they show is like a kid's wearing the t-shirt and then via the app, you can see basically like inside their chest and look at, you know, the, the bones, the rib cage, the spine or internal organs, the heart, the lungs, the veins, the arteries, all that good stuff. Um, this includes three, you know, 360 experiences where you can like move the phone and look around what the what a lot of the typical AR VR tools are going to do. Um, there's a heart rate tracker, which is actually really cool. You can do that through the app and then and then tons of other stuff, too. They've even got a language tie in so it, it can work in a whole bunch of different languages. So it just looks really neat. I think this stuff is fascinating. And if you're teaching anything within that realm it looks like mostly science-based um, it'd be really cool if you could outfit your classroom to do some of that stuff we've also got here one a different one called figment ar and figment ar is going to turn your world so whatever you're viewing through the app uh, they call it an augmented funhouse what i thought was cool is that it lets you sort of create your own scenes. So really let the student's imagination run wild. These include emojis, animals, objects, really anything else to kind of change your world. Uh, the educational applications for this, you would really have to get creative. Uh, maybe there's a project where you let the students build a world with a certain thing in mind, but that's what it's all about. I mean, their self-described tagline here is creating imaginative scenes out of the world around you. So. I mean, to me, it just looked fun. They have pretty good reviews, too, and uh, it's free. A lot of these AR, VR stuff, it's pretty complex, so you do have to pay for a lot of them or at least pay for some aspect of it, and this one is free. So it's worth taking a look if this is uh, something you're interested in. Yeah, those are two great ones. I'm glad that you spoke about both of them because I have not tried either one, but I think I'm going to have to try that second one. It sounds pretty awesome. The next group 
is uh, content creation. And the first one is called Green Screen. This is not free, but it might be worth it. And I had a teacher come up to me last week and said, this can't be the best one because I, I know of one called Do Inc. Well, Green Screen is by Do Inc. So it, it's, it's the same you know, product. It's the same product. So make sure that if you had Do Inc. on your iPad or your mobile device, now you're checking out Green Screen. A uh, couple things about this that I really like is you can tell a story, explain an idea, express yourself in a truly creative and new, unique way. All that you have to do is use your camera on your phone, or you can import pre-recorded videos, phones, text, and customized artwork. You could add drawings and animations up to 30 frames using the built-in drawing editor. Uh, so you could you have two different ways. You could do this live, or you could use something that you already shot, and you can edit it later on. So I, I think this is a great way of getting students to create things. Uh, I just got done using our green screen uh, with a class. They were reading um, one of our theme books. I can't remember if it was Great Gatsby or To Kill a Mockingbird. I think it might have been both. We did projects on both. Uh, for The Great Gatsby, you could take themes of the 1920s and basically make your own book cover. So what they did is they dressed up uh, um, as a scene, so prohibition. They dressed that up. Uh, they used the green screen and they made their own book cover for The Great Gatsby. It's an alternative book cover based on the theme that they were assigned or they chose. So Green Screen, also known formally as Do Inc., is, uh, is a great one. It's, uh, it's relatively inexpensive for how awesome it is, so go check out that one. Uh, the next one is called Chatter Picks. Chatter Picks uh, can make anything talk, whether it's a pet, a book, doodles, and more. You simply take a photo and draw a line that makes a mouth and record your voice. Uh, Chatter Picks uh, is fun. It's silly. You can make little greetings, playful messages, uh, creative cards, or even a fancy book report. I'm thinking of something like uh, George Washington giving a, a, a telling a story about the Revolutionary War or crossing the Delaware or something like that. So you would just take a picture of George Washington, have a line for a mouth, and it would do, and then you just like narrate it and it would take care of the rest. So that's chatter picks. And then our last one, which is one that we talk about uh, using it on our regular devices is thing link. Uh, it's the easiest way to annotate uh, pictures and make it interactive. So with ThingLink, you could create these virtual tours. They have 360 available. Uh, you could share interactive in images. You could create and use 3D models with clickable tags. So if you had a map and you put that uh, within ThingLink, you could drop different points there. And those points is students hover over it, you could have a video that goes with it or text or pictures, other pictures and things like that. So really it makes that map come to life. All these materials are readable in over 80 different languages. You can personalize any photo for any learning need that you want. Uh, you can use thing links on iPads, tablets, and in the classroom to develop digital literacy and future ready skills. Uh, you could also track engagement on all learning materials, videos, and virtual tours. Uh, and you can make interactive infographics, such as maps, virtual tours, curriculum organizers, project-based learning presentations, escape rooms, and digital breakouts for blended and distance learning. So this is one of those tools that is kind of a one-stop shop for anything uh, in the realms of blended learning, flipped learning, personalized learning, those types of things. So that's going to wrap up our 15 mobile apps for you for this episode. Nick, did, did I miss anything on those last three? No, you nailed it. They're just uh, three of, uh, of my favorites on the list. And I think they, you know, a lot of the things that we talk about all the time, like green screening and student content creation and flipped classrooms with thing link, um, you can do it with your phones too. And, and some of the, and sometimes you might have kids that prefer that, or maybe you get some better content out of it. If nothing else, it's just nice to know that it's out there as another option.
like you said, that does wrap it up for episode 108. As always, guys, you can do us some favors. Subscribing is the best thing for the show. Apple Podcast is number one. Spotify, Google Podcast, Stitcher. We're also on YouTube. You can find us there. We got tech, so subscribe there as well. Follow us on Twitter at Nick Got Teched, at Geis Got Teched, or just follow the show at We Got Teched. If you're a super fan, you can always write us a review. That'd be fantastic. And telling your friends about the show, about educational podcasts in general, tell them about gottech.com where we post all of our episodes, blogs, and free stuff for you. And don't forget about the Teach Better Podcast Network, everybody, that we are now super proud to be a part of. So you can check out their network online where you'll find us along with many, many, many other of the best ed tech, not ed tech, educational podcasts out there. So thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to Got Tech, the podcast. Remember to subscribe to our show and follow us at We Got Tech on Twitter so you can stay up to date with the latest episode releases, blog posts, product reviews, and PD announcements. You can also follow Geist and I individually at Geist Got Tech and at Nick Got Tech on Twitter or on Instagram at Nick Got Tech. Finally, remember to check out our website, gottech.com, where we post all our episodes, articles, and resources available to you for free. Until next time.